We're here to talk about scale. First, I want to tell you about Software. That's the company I work for. We're infrastructure as a service. Uh, so we do dedicated servers, cloud servers, CDN, all the cool stuff that goes along with it. We got a lot of data centers, a lot of servers, and we give away free stuff. So if you want free stuff, talk to one of these two people right here, Paul or Rita. Uh, we have an incubator program. But enough about software. Let's talk about me, which is my favorite topic. Anyway, so that's a slide about me. I like to fence. I like to do stuff. I'm, I'm this guy, like not the one winning. I'm the one that's getting clobbered. Uh, and bottom left hand, everybody thinks that's a shell. It's not. It's a mud. Does anybody know what a mud is? There's always at least one guy. All right, two. Uh, it's how I got into computing uh, when I was a kid, about 11 or 12. Uh, MUDs are like uh, World of Warcraft, but all text, basically. In a way, but it's multiplayer. So it's kind of like a text-based kind of thing. Oh, is it? I didn't even know. I honestly just like grabbed one off of Google. So, eh. Very awesome. Anyway, so uh, that's about me. I've been working in this industry, the infrastructure as a service industry, that we used to just call it web hosting. It kind of changed at some point in time for about nine years. Uh, and in that time, I've, I've seen a, a lot of changes in the way that things are done. And probably the, the biggest change, or at least the most profound change, I think at least, uh, has really been in the way that we put together solutions and the way that we design not only infrastructure but also applications and the symbiotic relationship that those two things have. Uh, when I was a sales engineer, though, I did that for about two and a half years, uh, we used to build solutions very, very differently. So we used to ask customers, okay, you're building a what type of app? And they'd say, okay, it's a flubby flu that does the thingy thing, you know? And they'd say, we want to support 50,000 users. And I'd say, okay, great. You need these seven servers that have this configuration and a load balancer and we need a big SAN that's going to cost you 40 grand a month and all this kind of crazy stuff. And they would sure enough have 40,000 users, but those, that 40,000 users would be maybe you know, a few hours every week, right? Their average use case was maybe a whole lot smaller than that. But all we had was a, a whole bunch of stuff to throw at it. There really wasn't a whole lot of options of how we could build it. Of course, there were choices in specific pieces of hardware. But the shift that, that I, I've kind of noticed that's very profound is that we no longer do that. We typically now, at least from my perspective, we build things from the bottom up instead of the top down. So we look at the average use case and we say, okay, on average, you want to support a thousand users. You know, uh, in the middle of the day, that's typically what you have. Maybe at your peak usage, you support 50,000 users or 100,000 users. We figure out what it takes for you to have a thousand, and then we figure out how to scale that up to meet it when you need it and then get rid, of it, get rid of it when you don't. Because if you do it the other way around, you're paying for a whole bunch of stuff that you're not always using. And so that, that's kind of the, the most profound change uh, that I've kind of seen. And it, it's very similar to uh, at least the old way. It's very similar to how you would build something like a road. So you got a whole bunch of lanes of traffic. You got to support X number of people going in two different directions. Uh, and this style of design is not inherently wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. In a situation like a road, it makes a whole lot of sense. And even some application and infrastructure design it does. When you have a whole lot of information about the uses that people are going to have for your business or infrastructure or whatever it happens to be that you're making. The problem with it is, though, if you're not agile enough, if you're not flexible enough, you run into a situation like this. Uh, this image doesn't look so good blown up on the screen. But it's a picture of a, a freeway in Houston when we had a, uh, I'm from Houston. Uh, we had a, a, a hurricane come in and they had to evacuate the city. So this is a six lane highway with two feeder roads. So altogether a whole lot of lanes of traffic. And they basically did what they're calling contra flow where everybody was going one direction. There was no going into town. It was all out of town. Uh, and you can see there's just a mess of cars on the road because they could not just tack on additional lanes of traffic. It's not something that you can do. That's how infrastructure used to be. It used to take days, weeks, or months to get a new piece of gear and throw it in your data center. And in fact, that's, that's not always, uh, uh, that's still sometimes true today. I was just talking to a large customer, uh, a large company, they're not a customer of ours, just a few weeks ago, and they were saying it takes nine weeks for them to go from placing an order of a server to getting the server usable in their data center. And so I asked them, what do you do if you get front paged on Reddit and increase your traffic a thousand percent. They said, well, we go down. I mean, that's, that's what we do. They don't have a plan for it. But the business that they're in, that's acceptable. It's okay to go down at that amount. They're okay with it, right? Uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the cool shift. And what's really interesting about it is not this kangaroo. So ignore the kangaroo for a moment. What's really interesting about it is the fact that we have the same tools. We've had virtualization and switches and routers and servers for a very, very long time. 
But recently, we've been able to kind of change the way we use these devices and put them together in different ways. Uh, and it's, it's really a change in perspective. And it has to do with the cloud movement and all these other kind of buzzwords. Uh, and from my point of view, it really has to do with abstraction. We used to really care about my application only works on Intel and it only works with Broadcom NICs and it only works on this type of infrastructure. We don't care about that as much anymore. We have programming languages that kind of abstract out that need to be so intimate with the hardware. So the kangaroo. Uh, everybody know what a kangaroo is, maybe? No? Nobody knows what a kangaroo is. I'm going to stand here until people start raising their hands. So, All right, awesome. People know what kangaroos are. Very good. So, you know, they call them joeys when they're little. Uh, they're quite ornery, from what I understand. Uh, they like to box or something like that. I've never seen one in person, so I couldn't tell you. I did eat one one time. That was actually in Vancouver. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting experience. But anyway, so kangaroos, ornery. Uh, if you take a, a step back and you look at a kangaroo from a different perspective, who's seen Jurassic Park or know what a Tyrannosaurus Rex is? If you look at it a little bit differently, th that, that kangaroo kind of looks a little bit like a little short-armed Tyrannosaur with the big legs and the tail. And, you know, if you've got a cup of water, you know, it starts rippling when he walks around and stuff like that. And that's kind of what I'm challenging you guys to do is, is really look at everything that you have or look at the business that you're running, look at the infrastructure that you have. You have to take a look from a different perspective. Uh, so I was working with a company uh, in Houston not too long ago and they have a, a pretty interesting business because they are kind of revolutionizing the way a very old business was done. And basically what they do is they sell information about geology, like different, different points of data about specific pieces of land. And the way they do this is, is they get a whole bunch of text documents and they take all this, uh, these text documents, they put them into like an access database kind of thing. Then they have a, a script that takes this access database and then throws it into their website and then creates products out of them and generates these PDF documents which people can download and learn about whatever piece of land they wanted. Uh, I was talking with them in a, a mentoring session uh, a while back at an incubator and they wanted to talk to me about the problem that they were having. They had hundreds of products online available for people to purchase, but they had tens of thousands of these documents that had not been entered into their system yet. And the, the struggle they were having was there was no uh, uniformity in these documents. So there was no way to easily script the importation of them, right? And so they came to me with this, this giant big problem, uh, and it's a, it's a problem that you could make a statement with, and it's really overly complicated. They were dealing with this huge, massive type problem and trying to eat it whole, so to speak, instead of you know, cutting it up into tiny little chunks or tiny little pieces. And so after talking with them, I, I kind of said, hey, why don't, why don't we take a step back here and look at what the real problem is? Is your real problem that you have all this data you need to import, or is the real problem that you can't sell that data, right? So, I talked to them about maybe coming up with a way to simplify what they're dealing with. And instead of worrying about how to capture these tons and tons of data and put it into a database, how about find some way to get some metadata from it, put it into a searching engine on their website, so that way that their customers can still know that they have this information. And then once the customer's interested, go and do the manual process of grabbing that document, doing all the data entry and all this kind of stuff to, to provide the PDF. Because the, the PDF is just the container for, for the information. Really the information is the important thing. Which brings me to what I'm going to say is the most important possible thing you can do with scaling is simplify stuff. All right? So you have to take that process down. They had this process of importing documents and taking it and putting it into this access database and then importing it into their website and all this generation and all this stuff. You have this huge kind of process. You chop it up into all these tiny little atoms, these individual parts. You find commonalities between these tiny little pieces, and then you group them back together into logical units. With me so far? We're kind of, you know, out in space here, kind of thinking, right? So once you get these, these tiny logical units, you can get a really good idea of what each one needs and wants and its hopes and dreams and desires and all that kind of stuff, right? It ex ex expects, expects a specific type of information in and it's going to output another specific type of information. 
So uh, I just like this quote. Uh, it's one of our engineers said it. I don't know which one, which is why there's no name on there. But anyway, a system can be so simple that there are no, or there are obviously no bugs, or it can be so complex that there are no obvious bugs. Just like the Death Star, this giant thing that can blow up a planet, but you know, one tiny unmanned fighter can shoot a torpedo because the exhaust port had ray shielding instead of, you get the idea, right? Anyway, so how does this all fit in to scaling? So like I said, we, we chop up these things into tiny bits, reform them into these logical units that each kind of have their own purpose and they do their own thing. When you start to run your application, like, and this, this kind of fits on multiple levels, it's a bit meta. Uh, typically I'm talking about the actual code itself, so actually bundling up services or bundling up methods or classes, however you want to look at it. Uh, but basically they're organized by function. Uh, when you actually start to look at things this way and you start to do deployments or you start to do load testing, whatever point in, uh, in time you are for your deployments, uh, you start to notice things. You start to see that maybe this specific piece of the infrastructure, this specific piece of the application needs a little bit more help than other pieces once you get to a specific set of users. Once you hit a thousand users, this part's lagging behind, this other one's not. And that really starts to help you uh, find your bottlenecks. And the bottlenecks, those are, those, those are exactly what those things are. They're, the par they're parts of your infrastructure that need a little bit more juice. They need a little bit more help. And then you start to look at them and you see, do I need a larger bottle? Do I need more bottles? Like, how can I solve this situation? How can I solve this problem? And that's, uh, I can't, but by the way, this acronym up here, TRTFTJ, I came up with that, right? It stands for the right tool for the job. So when you're tweeting about how awesome I am, make sure that you, you hashtag that. Nobody's done it so far. So I've given three talks with that, not one person. So, uh, so yeah, so you choose the right tool for the job. And what I mean by that is, now that we've taken our application and we've kind of decided these maybe seven, eight steps that it actually performs, we don't have to have all of those portions on the same server or even on the same provider, right? We can really take a look at Step one, this logical unit of my app, maybe it belongs in a cloud box, a, a cloud computing instance. Maybe it belongs inside a dedicated server. Something like a database is gonna work a whole lot better on a dedicated server, like a hardware bare metal server, as they're calling them now, versus a cloud computing instance. And something like a caching server is gonna play better in maybe a cloud environment. It really just kinda depends. But the key is that you can experiment with these things and try them out, and especially during the startup part uh, of your business, take advantage of things like software's you know, free services and all the other companies' free services because this is all about experimentation and figuring out how things work. And when you can experiment for free, it's a whole lot better than having to spend thousands of dollars to experiment. But you figure out what the right tool for the job is. And then once you decide that, yeah, okay, this, this database server belongs on this dedicated box, you can then start to look at what's the appropriate way to scale this individual portion of my application, right, or my infrastructure. Do we go vertical, which means the of both. It's a matter of experimenting with those things and trying to figure out which one works best. This is another acronym, or backronym, because I made it up after the fact. Pods, or uh, I'll wait for this train to do its thing, that way I'm not competing. It turns out it's much louder than me. Probably faster as well. Any questions so far? Either means I'm doing a great job or an awful job. You can never tell at this point. So anyway, so portable organizational deployment units uh, are pods. The concept here is we figured out the seven, 10, whatever it is, logical chunks for our application, our infrastructure. We've been able to figure out how to best scale them. How do we scale them horizontally? How do we scale them vertically? Uh, figured out what types of platforms you want to use. Do you want to use a third-party hosted cloud? Do you want to do it inside on your own because you have some spare gear? Whatever it happens to be. Then what you do is you start to kind of figure out, okay, this X number of web servers, database servers, application servers, and this CDN gets me 1,000 customers. It gets me 10,000 customers that can interact with my, my business in a performant way. That's when you can kind of start to look at your trends and you can start to say, okay, well, you know, for eight hours a day, I'm supporting 50,000 users. For seven hours a day, I'm supporting this many users. And then you start to throw out these pods as needed, right? So if I got an additional 1,000 users worth of load I need, I can just throw them out. And this is where you start using things like uh, uh, configuration management tools, imaging, APIs to make things happen automatically. 
Uh, one customer of ours uh, is a platform as a service, so the idea behind this is you just throw code at them, Ruby code, PHP, whatever it is, and then you just don't worry about anything. They just handle the rest of the stuff. They, uh, they use a, a product called uh, Nimsoft, which is a monitoring service. Anybody familiar with Nimsoft? Not so much. Okay, we got one. You work here, that doesn't count. Uh, but yeah, so Nimsoft basically just does server monitoring. So it looks at health checks, checks out uh, performance and all that kind of stuff. And whenever it sees that thresholds meet a certain level, they automatically order new servers, throw them into the firewall, load balancer config. This is the kind of idea I'm talking about here, is, is that you're able to kind of really get an idea of this little package with the bow on it and the ribbon equals X number of customers. And then you're able to order and then get rid of them as you need. And that's, that's another cool thing to do, is try to find a, a situation or a provider that allows you to do that. Maybe it's using multiple providers, whatever it happens to be. So uh, once you figure all this stuff out, uh, it's time to decide what happens when things go wrong, because they always will. Every pro uh, provider will have an outage of some sort at some point in time, whether it's a stick of RAM going bad or a data center getting hit by a comet or something. There are two main philosophies about how to deal with failure. I'm sure there's plenty of others out there, but these are the two that I typically deal with. Disaster recovery and highly available solutions. DR, disaster recovery, things have gone wrong. How do I get back to not being wrong anymore? It's disaster recovery. Highly available or redundant solutions mean, how do I not get into that situation in the first place? So uh, uh, like a common DR solution would be a failover site, for example. So you know, site A, A site, B site kind of thing, site 8 dies, everything fails over to site B. Uh, and a redundant solution would be something like you know, web servers on a, uh, a load balancer, or RAID, things like that. Uh, there's costs associated with both. Uh, highly available solutions typically just cost double whatever you were paying in the first place. So they can be pretty expensive. But you might need that. Uh, DR solutions are typically a lot cheaper depending on what you go with. The key though is, let's say uh, you're, you fail over to your DR solution because you got more users than you expected and you, you had not planned for it appropriately. And your DR solution is the exact same size as your primary solution and everything fails over to it, it's just gonna fail again. And that's the same thing with redundancy. If you've got a whole bunch of, let's say you got two web servers under a load balancer and both are at 75% and one dies, well now you've got too many users to be supported by one. So you really have to kind of play around with those things and see which one's best for you. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you just gotta look at everything and then decide how your application works. It's, it's very personal. It's a very personal thing between you and this thing that you've created. And, and, and what it means to your business. And all these little chunks, all these different little pieces that you've created, these logical units, some of them may be super important and if they go offline, maybe, you, maybe your business dies, maybe your reputation is tainted. But maybe it's some small piece of it that doesn't really matter, so it's okay to not spend a whole bunch of money on it, right? It's really a matter of figuring out and taking a step back and, and looking at things from the right perspective and, you know, not getting eaten by the T-Rex the deer. So that's what I got for you guys. What questions can I answer?